Awesome. Hello, all you fans. Welcome to a new episode of Who's Your Heartland podcast. I am your co-host, Ben Malcolmson, alongside my twin brother, Robbie Malcolmson and Kathy Chong. Robbie, could you tell our listeners more about where to find us, including our partnered sites? First and foremost, you can find our podcast on Twitter by searching at IU Heartland. You can also find us on Facebook. Please take the time to join our partnered social community, Indiana All For You. Kathy, could you tell everyone more about the benefits in joining our communities? Sure thing, Robbie. In the future, you will have the chance of obtaining free ticket giveaways to various IU athletic events. You'll also have the opportunity to connect with other like-minded Hoosier fans who love and appreciate the program as much as you do when you join our social community and follow us on the various social media platforms. Well, before we get to introducing our guests today, I wanted to give another special shout out to our small business sponsor, which is uh, Walls Drive-In. If you listen to our past couple of podcast episodes, we started speaking about them and also touching base with our guests on them too, but we'll kind of speed run through that one, this one, but we want to make sure we got a little bit of a shout out out for them. Again, their name is Walls Drive-In. They're a, a small business restaurant, basically, in uh, our hometown of Southern, in Southern Indiana called Canton, Indiana. Uh, they've been around for a long time, but for the last, I would say probably the last decade or so, they've been uh, shut down due to uh, ownership change. And they'll be firing back up in June. But again, that's more of like a place where people can pull up, get food. They can also get milkshakes and flurries. I mean, uh, a lot of people like refer to it as the tasty freeze. I mean, different places have that and there are different communities. So just want to take some time to give them a special shout out. So again, their name's Walls Drive-In. They're planning on uh, starting their business back up in early June if everything goes as planned right now. Uh, remodeling's in effect. But just again, want to give them a quick shout out, but we'll get right to it and introduce our guests. Well, Ben, it's enough talk about ice cream and wall bangers and, you know, talking about the Mr. Wiener of, uh, of Canton, Indiana, which I think Ward was from his town. I hope that's the name of the restaurant is whatever he had originally said it was. But to more important topic is our, our guest today. We are extremely humbled and honored to have him on our podcast for the first time. And we just found out before the show, this is his first podcast ever. So I'm calling him out on the yep. first one. And, but we really appreciate having him on the show. We have Indiana men's tennis coach, Jeremy Wurtzman. Jeremy, thanks a lot for joining us on the show today. Uh, I couldn't be more thankful. I, I really appreciate this. So looking forward to having a good conversation. Well, hey, I have a kind of an interesting organic hot seat sort of question for you. Maybe this will be the last time me and Ben and Kathy will do this. But Ben brought up like that small business in our little hometown. And I saw where you were originally, I think, from Rochester, New York. That's right. Uh, originally from. Uh, whenever you think back, maybe to Rochester, maybe even somewhere else, maybe in Bloomington, uh, do you also have, is there any kind of a small sort of nostalgic business or at least original place that you that's close to you that for some reason you always remember going to or, or having. We, we've asked our last probably three guests this question. I figured this might be a nice little warm up. Two spots right off the bat. One's a burger place and one's an ice cream place. Bill Gray's best burger I've ever had. It's in Rochester, New York. There's a bunch of them now. And Abbott's custard is incredible. Um, it's ice cream. I think they opened up one more maybe in Naples, but we grew up going to Bill Gray's for burgers and Abbott's for custard. It's two of the best things I've ever had to this day. That's awesome. That's just two more places I can write down. So whenever I'm traveling across the country someday and I get to go to Rochester, those are places to try out. I've been, I think that's the home of Wegmans. Like Wegmans place. Grocery as well. Great. One of the best subs that you'll ever have. So if you do make it there, you got lunch at Wegmans, dinner at Bill Gray's and, and Abbott's for dessert. Nice. We got a whole like three course meal all lined up for us. Well, hey, coach, we're going to go ahead and jump right into our first segment of just really getting to know the deeper philosophical side of what makes Coach Wurtzman who he actually is. I'm going to turn that over to Kathy for our first question. All right. Thanks, Robbie. All right. Getting to know Jeremy the person. So, coach, this is your first appearance on the show. And as Robbie calls you out, your first podcast. So, we would love to first get to know you as a person. Can you share some details? Tell us about your life. Like, where were you born and raised? We mentioned that you grew up in Rochester. Um, you know, like your mother and father, any siblings you might have had? Sure, Kathy. Yeah, my, uh, I grew up in Rochester, New York. Uh, both my parents uh, still live there. They both were raised there as well. Uh, they had myself and my older brother, Mark, who's uh, seven years older than me. And he actually played tennis at Ohio State before I did. 
um, which helped kind of lead me there. Um, and he also coached me when I was at Ohio State. So, you know, he's been a big part of, of my tennis career and always grew up playing whatever sport he played, baseball, soccer, tennis. Um, my dad's a huge golfer. So, you know, we definitely grew up playing all sorts of sports in Rochester and, you know, doing everything we can. No, no pro sports. Uh, we got Buffalo Bills right down the road. Uh, the Sabres not too far as well. Um, that are, we're huge fans, but uh, I'll tell you that there's Rochester's a great small town. Um, and it's a great place to grow up and, and play all sorts of sports. Well, coach, uh, could you also tell us a little bit about your family, like your immediate family? Like, the, do you have any wife and kids? Yeah. So uh, my wife, Gretchen, um, we've been married uh, since 2009 and we have three kids. Uh, we have an oldest uh, girl, Quinn. Um, her name, or sorry, her, uh, she's uh, nine years old. Uh, we have a middle daughter, Maya, uh, who's seven years old. And then we have uh, Buck, uh, my little boy, who's uh, three years old. He keeps us on, a, on our feet. My oldest, Quinn, she's actually, she's turning nine in July. She's still eight. So eight, seven, and three. Coach, I'll tell you what, that, that... Your youngest one, Buck, that, that is an amazing name. When, when I think of that whole name together, I was like, that almost sounds like a legendary NFL football player kind yeah. of name. You don't, you don't get a wimp with Buck Wurtzman. <laughs> like, and it sounds even just tough. It even sounds like such a New York, like, tough kind of uh, thing. Uh, and, and so, Coach, I think Ben did this on purpose with my educational background, the teaching thing. But can you give us a little bit of a window glimpse into your, your education as far as high school and college and what you actually majored in? Yeah, sure. You know, I grew up like uh, going to grade school and elementary school and middle school uh, in Rochester. But then my sophomore year of high school, uh, I moved down to Florida, uh, Sarasota, Florida, to train and to really give everything I had to my tennis. Um, I, I also went to, to, to a school, pri small private school in Sarasota. But the main reason was to go and, and have a full training uh, regiment. Uh, I just wasn't getting enough good practice. It was hard to get court times in Rochester. So it's kind of a little different than most. It's not that uh, different in the tennis world. A lot of the best players will move down to Florida or they'll move south, um, especially in the, some of the northern states. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I moved there. And then I actually went to University of Florida my freshman year, um, which was right down the road, and then transferred to Ohio State my last three years uh, and, and competed at Ohio State. So it's a little bit kind of all over the place. Um, but, you know, the good thing is I learned so much at each spot, each spot. I thought it was awesome to grow up in Rochester and, and kind of be the best player in my area in Western New York um, and then go to Florida where there's ATP pros everywhere. There's great college players. There's great junior players all around you. And you're just another you know, person just trying to, to get, get, get better. You know, you're, you're not nearly the best. Um, I learned a lot about being down there and kind of sacrificing everything for my tennis. Um, and then in college tennis, playing in the SEC, playing the Big Ten. Um, it, it was just really neat to, to be a part of so many different uh, programs. Well, Coach, you know, I, I personally really admire that uh, outlook from you uh, psychologically because you've done so much traveling and it sounded to me like you kind of went into your, your career with a lot of open-mindedness as an athlete and you were willing to go to all these different places and, and you, you were very cognizant about where you needed to go to get the most kind of court time. And I, and I really appreciate what you had started to end with there about you, you can look back and recognize that you gained something valuable from every one of those locations that you were at, which also tells me you know, if that philosophy carries on, I'm sure that you felt the same way about your entire coaching career and everything you've kind of lived that. And it, not even just in coaching, but just as being a, a father and a husband and all these other things. So I really admire that. Coach, something that just popped in my head with, with your family background, with having an older brother that was, a, was an athlete as, as well. It sounds like sports played a pretty large part in your family. With the whole uh, Michael Jordan documentary going on with The Last Dance, I have sort of a Last Dance-ish question for you because yeah. we seem to get this from a lot of um of our student athletes that's come on but also coaches too and, and, and i would assume that this is pretty familiar it'd be very unique um how competitive would you describe yourself to be as an individual because most of the time that's some common thing that we see with 
people, and we hear today, Michael Jordan, even when it comes to just card games, board games, it doesn't matter what it is. Dude, whenever you and your brother were growing up, did, have you always been a relatively competitive person as well? Yeah, you know, not so much with my brother. He was seven years older, so, you know, he was always – a lot better than I was. I wasn't really competing at the same levels uh, when he was. And he was kind of always my biggest fan and I was always his. So we, we really didn't have that type of uh, environment going on there. But growing up in Rochester, I would play against a lot of older kids. Um, you know, being in, in sixth grade, I, I'd play against high school players or even younger, you know, fourth, fifth grade playing against older older players. And it made me really competitive and really trying to push I played a lot of baseball I played soccer as well um, so I just loved to compete I wouldn't say I was as uh, uh, you know Jordan he, he's a little bit more uh, he shows it uh, in, in definitely in different ways I, I would say I was a little bit quieter than that I definitely would get I, w I wouldn't talk as much smack maybe as my, maybe Jordan does and maybe some of these guys but I definitely would grip my teeth and, and definitely it would kill me to lose. So, um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it definitely helps having an older brother and seeing him compete and seeing him play at such a high level. So you kind of live through those emotions and live through his wins and losses. And then I can bring that to my matches. And, and, you know, I definitely, uh, it was a definite advantage for me. Thanks for that insight coach. And, and you must've been pretty serious about tennis, about from early age, you know, if you went to Florida um, and kind of went far from home for high school. So when did your love for tennis first begin? Yeah, you know, I started really young. Uh, I started probably five, six years old and I would hit against the wall till uh, almost uh, there's stories that I would hit against the wall and I'd actually fall asleep on the side of the, the, the building because I, I was so tired from hitting. Um, so I, I really just always loved it. I love racket sports. Um, and I was pretty, pretty good from a young age. So I think that definitely helped being successful and, and doing well in tournaments. Um, but yeah, it's just tennis has always been such a passion for me. Um, I, I love the, being alone out there and, and trying to find ways to win and problem solve. And it all, you know, if, when you win, there's no better feeling than when you win in tennis, cause it's all on you. Uh, and when you lose, it, it, it kills you, but you know that you you were the reason and, and you gave everything that you had. So it's a really unique sport um, and it can get lonely, but I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I, I just love the, the, the ups and downs, the, the ebbs and flows of matches and really all the nuances that come with, with the game of tennis. Nice. Uh, I played tennis in high school myself. I wasn't very good, but I can completely relate to, to what you're saying. I'm so curious because you got to experience tennis in both the SEC and the Big Ten. Um, you know, a lot of people might say, oh, the SEC is crazy about football. And I'm just so curious, like, how was it different playing tennis in the different conferences? Yeah, looking back, it, it was interesting. You know, when you're going through it and you're playing, you're just kind of playing matches. But when I look back on it, really in the SEC, and I was a freshman, so, you know, I was – only just turning 18 when I got to University of Florida and I played number one and two singles as a freshman. So it was, it was very competitive. I played two and then the senior uh, that was playing number one got hurt. So I actually got to move up to number one singles. And I'll say the level of players that I was playing in every SEC match was unbelievable. I mean, it was, I was playing guys, every guy I played was probably in the top 10 in the country. And they were probably 22, 23, 24 years old from some country that I'd never heard of. And, you know, you're playing four guys, four years ahead of you from another country. And they're one of the best players in the country. It, it's just things are coming off their rackets like you've never seen before. So I learned so much from that, from that year. And, and I had some success, but by the end of the season, um, it really wore on me and, and, and the level, you know, got to me. So I think that uh, in playing outdoor tennis, you know, down in Florida, every match you go to, there's no indoor facilities in the SEC. Now there might be a few more, but at the time, if it rained, you waited it out. You play at midnight, you play the next day. You know, now there, there's so much more money and everyone has these beautiful indoor facilities all around the country. But at the time, we just kind of would compete and you play in all sorts of humidity and, and, and crazy uh, winds and things like that. So I learned a ton from playing in those environments. And I went to the Big Ten, and I knew a lot more of the players. Um, I'd say the level 
uh, was strong really at the top of the Big Ten, but then it kind of wasn't as strong towards maybe some of the bottom teams in the Big Ten, um, even at the, the higher spots in the lineup. And you're also playing indoor tennis where there's no elements. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's uh, – I wouldn't have been as good if I didn't get the experience that I got at University of Florida and playing against those players, especially at a national level. But playing in the Big Ten, you also, you know, indoor courts, fast, you know, cities are, are – are, you're going into facilities that are – lights aren't great and, and just a lot of different things. Huge serves are coming at you. Um, and, and the kind of the, the, the fans are right on top of you, especially at, you know, some of the top schools in the Big Ten. So, you know, in the, really looking back, they both had such different experiences, but they kind of made me um, a better player, both of them. Coach, I think one of the uh, – and I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know as much about tennis uh, as I would like to going into this interview or even just over the years growing up, you know, being being 36 now. But I remember growing up, Robbie and I used to uh, turn on HBO and at least watch Wimbledon every year. That was almost like a thing that yeah. we just enjoyed doing. But but just uh, when you were talking about the SEC Big Ten difference and you made some comments there, I think it's really unique about tennis too, and it's not to really separate it from other sports, but just that international level within tennis. So you mentioned you're playing against guys that are from different countries you never even heard of. So not only are they from different countries, but they're also traveling to either play in states collegiately, like you know you you would like even though you're up in Rochester, traveling down to Florida. If you, you know if you're that good, you'll be traveling to those other areas, or at least those warmer tropical areas where you can actually play tennis in, the, in a desirable temp. But I think that was kind of unique unique about the sport over there but you're right I think the individual factor it, it's just got to be so tough because you, you don't think about it as much but I remember just enjoying watching matches and just that back and forth between the two athletes throughout the course of a match is just uh, it's really intense obviously and I couldn't imagine being the one out there playing you also play professionally too which we're going to talk about later but uh, one of the other uh, challenging things to do because you did focus a lot on singles but you also have had your share of experiences playing doubles over the years and I think that's got to be even more challenging whenever you're there's another one of you on the same side you're, you're facing two others on the other side I mean but what was that difference like for you is what I want to ask you like you know what's the biggest challenge from going from singles to doubles yeah you know I had a lot of success in doubles uh, especially in my junior career uh, myself and my partner we were really close friends he went out to Stanford and uh, won a national title out there um, he also I think he won the French Open and mixed doubles. Um, he, he, he was he wins over the Bryan brothers. So he was a great player. He turned into a great player. Um, so I was lucky to have him as a partner in the juniors. But we won pretty much every national tournament that we would play. We were in the finals or, or would win it from a young age, from 13, 14. So um, I really got a lot of confidence from winning those matches and winning those tournaments and beating some of these players on the doubles court which then when I would play some of these guys in singles, I had the confidence I could play with them or beat them. Um, and I think one thing that really uh, made me successful in doubles was I love the team environment. I love having someone to, to kind of go at. We, we were very close. We would, after every point we would talk, um, we we're very communicate, we always communicating. Um, but also my return of serve and my good mechanics, um, and everything's a little bit faster in doubles. So growing up in Rochester, where there's a lot of indoor tennis, you'd go to these, a lot of the nationals are all outdoors. So I'd go to these outdoor tournaments and in singles, the rallies would be so much longer. You'd have all these elements where the heat was so hot. So I would have, you know, some fatigue issues or cramping, but in doubles, it was quicker and faster. And I think that's where my game kind of flourished and came out, which then eventually I would have more success um, and on the singles court and especially in college, it helped me a lot as well. So um, yeah, doubles was always uh, kind of what I really excelled in first uh, in, in junior tennis, which really kind of put my name out there and, and helped me kind of get a lot of confidence uh, that I could be good in tennis. Coach, before we dig even deeper into your own athletic experience, before you started coaching, uh, something that, that always kind of fascinates me is these kind of sports reality, the kind of behind the scenes shows, like your hard knocks that's really popular in NFL. And uh, and even though they're sensationalized, we do get to see kind of a side 
in sports. And, and I know in the, in the higher revenue sort of sports, especially in the state of Indiana, I know that there's a bigger focus on basketball sometimes or football. And we see a little bit of the behind the scenes. Um, but something that I, definitely as a kid that we, we underestimated big time is just the level of conditioning that you have to be in to play tennis or any of these sports. Because, you know, even just watching you play a match, it doesn't even do justice to what it must be like to have to be as quick as that you have to be and be able to move so, like, laterally like that. And it's just incredible. And something that I don't think that we, we get enough of a glimpse in sometimes is what is the conditioning like to prepare for something like that? Because the level that you played at from, from high school, college, and the pros, and now the level you coach at, something that we've seen over the years, because I know I'm kind of compounding things here, Coach, is that – um, you know, I love hearing these stories about what players like Steve Alford's podcast with the, the Hoosier Hysterics talked about how they didn't have like a strength program. Like players just kind of willy nilly went in and worked out on their yeah. own thing now. And things have just changed so much. Could you kind of give us like what, what was conditioning like for you to prepare for that? And then over the years, especially you as a coach, how has conditioning changed a lot like it has that we've seen from our lens in basketball and football? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I think it is. It's a lot of it is talent. A lot of and talent, I think, is you know what you're able to achieve and what you're able to learn on the go and learn as you improve. Um, you know, I'm not talking about God-given talent. I'm talking about how much you can give to your sport and, and improve and get better. And one of the biggest parts of that is the fitness. Um, and I'll tell you what, it, it wasn't really that big when I was growing up. Um, and it's something that I, I would say I regret a little bit. I think if I could have become a better athlete, um, more physical, um, I think that would have been a difference maker when I did get to the highest, higher levels, especially on the pro tour. Um, it's just very physical each and every match. And then you have to do it the next day and the next day after that and the next week. And there's really not a, a long break. Um, but just each match is so taxing. Um, and if you can't give everything you got, you know, something's going to, you're going to start seeing your results not be as strong. So um, I think the physic, physical fitness has come so far. There's been so much more research done. There's so many more coaches that are putting so much more time that are only focusing on strength and conditioning within tennis. Um, I think it's a very s specific sport that you can work on. Uh, you know, you're not trying to get heavy weights, but there's definitely need weight training, but then you need the aerobic training, but then you also need the flexibility. So there's just so many things, you know, I, I hear stories of Djokovic and Nadal. I mean, they're putting in, you know, 12, 13 hour days with, with fitness, you know, it, they, they play tennis, but then they're also putting their time with fitness. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is the only fitness I really did was on the court um, growing up in the juniors. I really didn't do any weight training or any physical fitness you know, too much off the court. It was mostly what I could get on the court. And in college, um, we didn't, we had a set plan. Um, and it was, it was good, it, but it's kind of what you got out of it. Um, and, and I think I got more out of the tennis part. I was, I was pushing myself in practice every day and I, that was kind of all I could really give. So when I got to the weight room, I, I wasn't ready to really give a hundred percent um, well, I, I would give everything I had, but I wasn't kind of focused. I felt like I had given enough throughout the practice that I really didn't need the fitness. And looking back, I think if I, I would have focused way more on the fitness and that would have helped a ton. So I try to tell our team, you know, now the resources we have, the strength coaches we have, everything that you have around you, take advantage of it because the fitness and, and, and what you can get out of that I think it can be sometimes more valuable than what you're going to get on the court. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers the question uh, of, of the importance of the fitness and, and what it can do for you as a player and also as an athlete. I think when an 18 year old comes into to IU, I'm hoping they become a better athlete when they leave at 22, not just a better tennis player. Yeah. Great answers, coach, on both of those, and, and inspirational on top of that. Uh, but on the on the second segment, we want to get into more about you, you know, on your your athlete days and what's kind of flashback again towards your prep, your prep career, and then going into collegiately. Can you tell us a little bit more about your prep career back in high school and how that led to the opportunity to play collegiately? Yeah, sure. Uh, like I said, I, I was, uh, you know. At the younger age groups, I was very successful in doubles. Um, in the boys' 14s, I won uh, multiple national titles. And I actually 
got a lot of, like I said, I got a lot of confidence. I won a national title in singles. Um, there's three national tournaments, the clay courts, the hard courts, and the national indoors. And so I won the doubles titles in, in the clay courts and the hard courts. And then I won the national indoors um, in singles. So it was kind of, uh, that's where I was kind of getting at that I started to believe that I could win at the highest level at a young age. Um, and that kind of carried me. That was kind of how it was. I would do really well in doubles um, at the outdoor events and then really well in singles in the indoor events. So I was kind of always one of the, the better top juniors. Um, you know, we had a lot of really good players within our, our group. Um, Andy Roddick, Marty Fish, uh, Taylor Dent were three guys that were Grand Slam players and, and um, Grand Slam champions. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was a good, uh, solid group uh, among a lot of other players that um, some of the you might have heard of, you might not have. But uh, then moving into college, you know, I had a lot of options. Um, it was on my mind possibly maybe to take a year off. At the time, the rules were different um, and try the pro circuit right after high school. I wasn't nearly ready for that, not even close. Um, at the time, you might think you are because, you know, you're around – player you know being in Florida I was around some of the best in the world I was around the coaches were great they were pushing it but I wasn't nearly nearly ready uh to do that and and so I decided to uh to take University of Florida which was just a couple hours away um and and, and see w how good I could get you know the, the goal was when I went to college to be good enough when I finished whether that was one year two years four years that I would be able to play on the pro circuit um, that was really what I was there to do in, in college was it was to try to be a pro and get as good a tennis as I could get. But, you know, you, you go through a lot of different emotions through college and a lot of different experiences. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was neat, you know, going back to my junior days as well. I got to play in the junior U S open, which was an amazing experience. I never got to play the U S open as a pro. So playing in the juniors was one of the, things that I can always say was pretty cool to be around a Grand Slam event like that. And uh, yeah, I th you know, I try to connect with a lot of the players I have now with that uh, to show them that, you know, I was one of them. I was one of the, the better players like you guys are. And, and I know what we can do to, to become a good college player. So I try to use uh, all those experiences. Coach, I found your answer very complex and also like inspirational in a way because you know, it seemed like, you know, you did have a lot of success in doubles and singles throughout your career and through your talent. But I admire the fact that you were actually able to share with us a little bit of the hardship, too. The, the fact that when you first entered, uh, you know, different realms during your career, you, you realized that even though psychologically in that moment, you thought from your success stuff that you were probably ready. But you even realized in that moment that you, maybe you weren't ready yet. But rather than just kind of backing off or giving up in a way, uh, you, you continue to persevere. It's almost like you sought out as many other outlets as you could in order to, to give you the best foot forward in your career. So I thought that was a really cool way of, of sharing that. Uh, just to kind of get into a little bit of, about that experience with you, because we love to do this with our student athletes as too, is what was your re recruiting experience like, especially now uh, from the perspective of the high school teacher, you know, you see all these like official signings that they do at school that I think is so cool for the kids and their family when the college comes in and they have the whole background. Yeah. And they get the news in. It's almost like these little press conferences. And, and we've started doing, you know, you see schools doing this for CTC, like, you know, like, you know students now it's not even just athletes anymore it's like kids that are getting careers and maintenance jobs are getting companies that come in and do signings for them now like an athlete so for for you kind of going through high school you said you know college was a weird emotional time I, I could definitely uh, agree with you on that but you know high school and all that stuff is also I don't think your whole life is just an uncomfortable emotional experience but when you're like ending in high school and you're trying to figure out really where your next avenue is going to be at what was that experience like? What was it like to go see other schools and have schools come and talk to you? Just, just that experience in general. Yeah, I'll say this. It's a totally different uh, – it's 100% it's, it's different now. It's, uh, you know, looking back, I didn't have a cell phone in high school. There was no computers, so there was no – I didn't have an email until I got to college. Um, there, we were kind of right on the brink of it all. You know, I think I got a cell phone, maybe my sophomore year of college, I got a computer, my, maybe my freshman year of college. So basically going back to high school, you just had a public, you know, I, 
I was down living in a test academy. So I had a call. The coaches would call my house, but I wouldn't be there. So my parents would talk to them and then they would have to tell them, well, you're going to have to call down to Florida. But at the time you can only call once a week. So a lot of times they'd talk to my parents and they would never actually get through to me because they don't know where I was or what I was doing or, you know, a lot of times I was at practice and you go to dinner, then you hang out with your friends for a little bit, you know, other players at the Academy. And then, you know, you you go back and you watch some TV and go to bed. I wasn't looking for the phone to ring or there wasn't a text message coming in or anything like that. So it was just a lot different. Uh, I didn't have that, those type of experience. So a lot of times it, it was very little, uh, recruiting until I got to the visit. And then I was like, Oh, okay, this is the way it is. And so the official visits were kind of, were kind of big for me. Um, and I took, uh, four visits. Um, well, I, I'd spent a lot of time at Ohio state cause my brother had played there and I can get into that a little bit later, but, uh, I really only took three official visits, one to Florida state, one to Florida. Uh, they were both were just a couple hours away from my living and then one to Illinois, university of Illinois and Illinois was kind of right on the brink. They won a national title when I was in college and they were really doing a lot of special things at the time. So, um, yeah, and it, it came down to a couple of the coaches at the academy were from the University of Florida. They played there, so they knew the the uh, the coach really well. And then one of those coaches actually became the assistant coach um, while I was, so my junior, uh, sorry, my senior of high school, he actually went to be the, the assistant coach at the University of Florida. So there's just a lot of connections there. I felt comfortable there. I really liked the head coach. I thought he did a great job with the players. They, they made the uh, semifinals the year before the year before I got there. So they, they were top four in the country um, and, and it had won the individual singles national championship. So it was moving in a good direction. And yeah, I just uh, kind of jumped at that opportunity and uh, just had a great, great official visit. So Looking back, though, you know, I, I probably didn't do my homework nearly enough. I didn't do enough research. I didn't talk to enough coaches. Um, I didn't take really all the visits I could have taken. I was really focused in on, you know, hanging out with my friends down in Sarasota and, and, and going to tournaments and, and playing uh, as many, you know, playing as many hours as I could in a day. It, it really wasn't um, this huge recruiting thing that, that, that these kids go through now. You know, the signing. I think I signed in my kitchen. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone was there. You know, it was just like, can we get this done and send it back? So, yeah, it's just uh, there's, there's no majestic media. Like, there's, yeah, there's no, no majestic screen picture in your house of the kitchen and you yeah. guys all signing on the table. It, yeah, it I mean, cool. yeah. If, if you had a phone, you've had to get one of those, you know, phones from the CVS that you know, you, you have to go, you never get them, you never get them filmed anyway. So, or you never get them, you lose them all the time anyway. So it's just totally different. You didn't have your phones to just take a quick photo of anything. So. Yeah. I think the closest thing that we all had to a phone back in the late nineties was like a Tamagotchi that you were trying to keep alive or yeah. something like that. Those kind of things. Coach, have you ever like really thought, because I'm sure you see it obviously from the coach's lens now, but if you could take like high school Jeremy and put him in today's society with all of the social media and all the different connections and the new rules with recruiting, like how do you think Jeremy from Sarasota, Florida would have handled all of this now? Because it, it, it's just curious to me, like from the coaching perspective, when you, when you have your new athletes come in your program, they have gone through a lot of this kind of stuff and you didn't whenever you were younger. Uh, you know, just what, what is that you would think what it would have been like if you would have been going through that same situation? Yeah, I think I would have liked it, to be honest. I would have liked the attention. I would have liked to have coaches notice that, you know, or that, to show that they really wanted you. Um, you know, I think there was very few that were, were doing that. A lot of times, you know, they because the whole thing's changed. I mean, they were running summer camps. They were, you know, teaching lessons a lot. They, the 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 salaries were, were so much lower assistant coaches weren't even really allowed to recruit you can only have one coach recruiting at a time now there can be two coaches recruiting at, at, at you know all the time so just uh you really didn't get a feel too much that coaches were, were after you and, and really wanted you. you you didn't get much information because it was all being sent in the mail um you know through the post office and half the time that would get lost it wouldn't get to me so 
yeah, I just feel that uh, it would have been really neat to, to learn more and, and build better relationships with different people and, and different coaches and, and learn more about their programs, um, especially now looking back because, you know, I would have loved to, to, to use a lot of the things that, that I learned or, or got close to some of these coaches because then now you're, you're playing against them, you're competing against them. Um, and I think, you know, when you're competing against them as a player, you know, there's a lot of emotions, a lot of things going on on the courts. It's different when you're getting to know them when they're recruiting you and, and you can really build a, a strong relationship. So even if I didn't go to that school, so I think it really would, I would have loved it. Um, I, I, it's too bad that uh, it wasn't that way then. So, but you knew, you knew no different. So you didn't, it, it was simpler. I'll tell you that much. Everything was much simpler. <laughs> yeah I remember I remember the simple days too Robbie and I do when you didn't have that you just had the landline I remember the early days of internet and just being dial up and if someone picked up the phone you're disconnected that's just how it worked <laughs> back right. then but uh yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh what's was one of the most interesting things about researching you coach was back at your days at Ohio State I mean you played well enough to get inducted into the Hall of Fame I mean I could imagine what that feeling was like for you and that's kind of that's basically what my next question is I wanted to give our listeners a little bit of tie in there because you know for those that in the IU committee you might just know Jeremy on the level of him being the tennis coach but his playing days collegially especially at Ohio State 2004 All-American you were a three-time All-Big Ten selection I mean that, that's just to name some off there it says here you're also the the first Ohio State men's tennis player to receive the honors since back whenever the coach Ty Tucker was in 1991. You're the first Buckeye to win ITA National Championship, capturing both in 2003-2004. I mean, the stats are just pretty impressive. Top 10 in career singles victories, top 15 in career doubles victories. But then when at that moment, I mean, you flash over your career, Coach, because, I mean, I mean, especially for now, it might seem like years and chapters in your life a long time ago now, but whenever you got to go back, I think it was in 2016, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but when you got inducted and you got to go to that special event, you know, can you, can you walk us, walk us and our listeners through what that feeling was like for you to get that honor? Yeah, no, it was incredible. It, it Ohio state means so much to me. It has given me so much, um, so many amazing doors open, so many opportunities. It, it's, it's, uh, it was great to be a part of that program so you know ty tucker wasn't the head coach when i was getting recruited um and and so at university of florida um that coach uh was actually let go after my freshman year and ty tucker i had known for a long time just through my brother uh, my brother playing college tennis there and um, i knew his passion how great he was i don't think at the time um he was kind of new to coaching um, and, and kind of making his mark and you know he, he really sold me on his passion and what he wanted to do as a tennis program there um, and so coming into that program as a sophomore um, and, and taking you know some of the experience I had at Florida but really I grew as a person and as a tennis player with Ty Tucker uh, and, and part of that program and he, he was a close friend um, someone I could rely on uh, off the court and he was someone that pushed me to my limits daily on the court. Um, so I was really lucky to, to be around that. And I use a lot of the coaching and, and everything that um, he, he did with our teams and with myself. Um, I, I, I'm able to use that and push our guys now. So uh, getting into the hall of fame um, was, you know, remarkable. I, I was, I was completely, pretty, pretty shocked. You know, I was pretty young at the time. So it was kind of, you, you kind of feel like maybe it was too soon. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, it's a good thing I got in when I did, because there's a lot of, a lot of players that have done many things better than I did. Uh, you know, you got three, four time, all Americans, national champions, big four, big four time, big 10 champions. And, you know, it was just, a, it's just been a different part of the program but I think the cool thing was was I got to to be kind of the first part uh kind of the the, the foundation um and help build that tradition um and that, that's something that he sold to me when I when I showed up there so it's pretty cool that uh that it, that it has become the program that it's become and that I was honored to be in the hall of fame and, and something that I can share with my family and my kids and they can kind of see uh how how special and how uh 
much I meant to that team. I, I, I hope that I, that I did. So. Yeah, I think it absolutely definitely answers that question, coach. I think it, or that thought anyways, that you did mean a lot to that program. Like you mentioned being young, uh, feeling like you were pretty young back to the time when you got inducted. But I think that speaks volumes about how good of an athlete you were and how, uh, respected you were too for you to be at least I think there's a voting process that goes into that to whoever's involved in that there or whatever but for them to vote you in that soon after your playing career I think that speaks volumes about you as a person so and as an I athlete agree. so but uh, uh Kathy I'm gonna turn this over to Kathy on this one yeah so when you look back on your early chapters of your story either from high school or college or the pros um, who are some of the people that inspired you along the way? Because you already mentioned Ty Tucker. It seems like he's someone that inspired you from a tennis perspective. Is there anyone else from a tennis perspective or is there someone from a non-tennis uh, perspective that inspired you along the way? Yeah, you know, I, I talked a little bit about my brother. You know, he was someone that uh, I always looked up to that was uh, playing national tournaments when I was younger and then playing college tournaments. Um, or sorry, playing at Ohio State. So I go to all the matches and, and watch him play uh, or as many as I could. Um, and, and so that was kind of neat to, to be able to see him compete and, and look up to and, and, and use what I saw to, to play. Um, you know, some of the pros, Sampras and Agassi was hot. That, that rival was hot when I was growing up. So I was looking up to those guys and, and watching them uh, everything, trying to copy them, everything that they did, trying to wear the same clothes. Uh, so I had the jean shorts and the high tops and all, and all sorts of things that they go, I could never grow my hair as long as Agassi, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, those, those, those guys were, were characters. You had Mack and O'Connors. They're kind of at the end of their careers, but just such huge personalities. Uh, Todd Martin was another great American player that was making a lot of the runs at the U S open. Um, Jim Courier, Michael Chang. I mean, American tennis was just booming. And it was you, everyone, every draw, you get to the quarterfinals and probably six of the guys were Americans. So it was pretty neat to be able to relate to those guys and, and look up to them. You just kind of had your pick of who you wanted to be like, what racket you were going to use and, you know, who you're going to copy. And you really could uh, change every year because there was a new, you know, for that time there's, an American was winning in a grand slam, I think each and every, uh, each and every year, a different grand slam. So it was pretty, uh, pretty special time to grow up as an American tennis player. Um, outside of tennis. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you're watching, we mentioned the last dance. I mean, Michael Jordan was, you know, growing up in the nineties, he was, he was incredible, but uh, I was a huge bills fan. So Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas and, um, and those guys, Andre Reed, I, I loved, watching Jim Kelly play and, and everything that, that he brought. Um, and then for the Knicks, you know, Patrick Ewing was always a, a player that uh, I liked the way he composed himself. So those are some of the, the guys that go back to my, my days. I guess this is a bad time to mention that in the 90s I was a Cowboys fan. Uh, <laughs> I expect you just to walk off. Now, but this yeah. interview is over. <laughs> was, how'd you but, become a Cowboys fan? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, like, it's weird because we, we came – I don't know if you if – you, I'm sure – man, you living in Indiana now and coaching in Indiana, I'm sure you have been exposed to some extent about the movie Hoosiers. But me, yeah, me and I ben, saw it in the movie theater. I saw yeah, it yeah, in the also, movie theater. And and well, was, me and Ben's hometown is a lot like the town in that movie. I mean, I'm talking the school the same with the wooden stairs that go up to the top. I mean, yeah. our high school literally had like 120 people in it. So we didn't actually even have a football program. But I remember growing up and, and my, our, our parents, we, me and Ben had the older parents. Like our, our parents were already in like their – their late forties and early fifties, whenever we were graduating high school. So my, my dad, whenever he was younger, he, he remembered Roger Stahl back in that version of the Cowboys. So I think it's, it's because he liked them a little bit, but our family was much more of a basketball. So I, I, I guess it was the best answer to say is that it's kind of a bandwagon sort of jumping version of a Cowboys fan because I liked them because my dad did, but at that time they were having that stretch where they were doing really well. And I think I just kind of hopped on. I, I actually cringe when I tell people today that I'm a Cowboys fan because I'm like, because I, I just know that 90% of other people just can't stand them. 
Um, but you know, let, let's peel back another deeper layer of uh, Jeremy Wurtzman here and kind of go into something that's a whole other different realm of competition. You, you had a great successful career as an athlete, but yet you didn't hide from some of the challenges that kind of came along and some of the obstacles along the way. Um, but now you, you decided then to start taking the leap of faith into coaching. What was it really initially that drove you into to going to be a coach in general? Because I know you had some uh, experiences as an assistant for a while first, like a lot of coaches do, or if not all of them, and then yeah. you became the head coach. Uh, and again, of course, you end up coaching in the Big Ten. It even sounds like in your recruitment, whether it was Ohio State with your brother or a little bit of exposure with Illinois, you kind of always had a little bit of a – exposure to Big Ten, it seems yeah. like in a way, but what really drew you to coaching? Yeah, no, it, it was something I knew I, I wanted to stay in tennis, to be honest. I think that was the main thing that I knew. I loved the sport and I, I wanted to give back, but uh, I think the best years that I look back on were my three years at Ohio State and how lucky I was to be a part of that program and to watch it grow and go from, you know, three, four in the big 10 and 20 in the country to uh, playing for a big 10 title. We didn't win it. We lost in the finals in a battle, but we got to the quarterfinals of the NCAA tournament um, and, and won, you know, with the team that really never made it past the first couple rounds of the NCAA tournament. So that was kind of a special, um, special time uh, to be a part of that program. And, and I really wanted to build something like that and, and, and to have, I just thought college coaching was the coolest thing that you could do. You know, what a great profession. And um, my, what my, well, my wife now, my girlfriend at the time uh, was living in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, she was also a very good tennis player. And we started dating, actually we're, we're high school sweethearts. We started dating in Sarasota. So probably a lot of times when I, wasn't uh, answering the coach's calls. I was probably hanging out with my, <laughs> my Gretchen. Uh, we were, you know, 15, 16 years old, uh, training at the same tennis academy. And she ended up going to Purdue University and played number one singles um, and was an all Big Ten selection as well. So anyway, she was out in Boulder, Colorado, um, working for Babylon, which is a tennis, uh, tennis company. And I had kind of been playing after college and, and doing okay, but kind of struggling a little bit to, to make ends meet and to, to really see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I was kind of hanging out with her out in Boulder. And then one of my good friends got the, uh, Danny Westerman got the job at University of Denver. And he asked me to come be his assistant coach. And what a great city, what a great school as well. It's a really kind of diamond in the rough. It's, it's a beautiful campus, right? Nestle in the mountains. And we kind of took that to program and we, we treated it like, you know, a, a big 10 team or a team that was uh, trying to, to be at a national level. And by our second year there um, with a great group of guys, just uh, those guys were bought into everything we were trying to do. I mean, we were so young and I was only 20, he was probably 28. I was probably 26 at the time, or maybe even younger. I might've been 25. So, you know, looking back, that would be hard to, uh, to hire an assistant that young now, but at the time we, they listened to us and, and, and we, they bought into what we were trying to do. And, and we made the NCAA tournament our second year there and, and, and was top 30 in the country with a, with an all American, um, which was kind of unheard of, of a school like that at the time. Um, so that, that led me uh, back to Ohio state and I became the assistant coach for Ty, which I, I thought was, um, something that I, I would probably never leave. I, that, that's, you know, I, I gave so much to that program as a player and you're back as an alma mater. And I was like, you know, what a great experience. So my wife and I, we got married um, that summer and we, I got offered the job. So I, I moved back to Columbus and, and, and she started to coach tennis uh, to the top juniors in, in Columbus uh, in the area. And I was the assistant coach and we had an awesome year. We, we won, uh, won the Big Ten, made it to the finals of the NCAA championship and lost in the finals to USC in a battle. But I uh, got to learn so much about being around those guys and being around Ty on a daily basis um, in the coaching environment. Um, it was tough. You know, he was tough on us, but um, it was uh, definitely a special time for me. But in saying that, my wife and I, we, we saw an opportunity to do something together. And we love Denver. So 
what happened was we went back to Denver, Colorado, and I took the head job as the head women's coach, and she became our assistant coach. Um, and I say that, I wouldn't say that was uh, maybe just by title, but, you know, I was definitely, uh, we definitely were co-coaches there. Um, and we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, it was a time that, uh, you know, I never coached women before, and so I was learning on the go, and, you know, she was helping me a lot, and we were having a, just a lot of fun living in, in Denver, Colorado, being at University of Denver and trying to build a team and, and do something uh, that, that we really look back on. It was such a special time. But um, as time went on, uh, we had kids, and that made it really hard to, to travel. <laughs> we were hiring nannies or family was flying to matches. It, it just became really difficult with kids for her to continue to coach. Um, and, and for us to, to continue, continue to do it. But we, we definitely grew the program. By the end, we had won a, uh, a Sun Belt. No, sorry. We won the uh, Mount, Mountain West, MAC. I think it's the MAC championship. They had switched conferences a couple times. So we won the MAC um, and, and we're a really good team. Uh, so we looked back and we felt like it was a success. Um, but as we had kids, it was something that we didn't feel like we could continue to do. Um, and I wanted to kind of get back to the Big Ten. Um, that was something that was special. And, and I decided that, you know, I, maybe I could um, go back to the men's game and, and, and connect well with a lot of the players, or similar players to, to, to what I went through um, when I was growing up as a, uh, uh, as a college tennis player. And so I went back to University of Michigan um, and was the assistant coach there um, for a year and a half. And then was lucky enough that IU called and, or it was very fortunate that they were willing to take me on as the head coach, but it is, it was always a goal um, to, to come back to the big 10 because that's just what, you know, I spend so much time here and it, I, I really know the landscape and, and know the uh, integrity and the ethics and everything that goes into the big 10. I, I'm really proud to be a part of it. Um, so yeah, it was, that's kind of the long story. Um, I, I might've lost you and maybe what I was trying to answer but I think uh, when I go back to it, the biggest thing that I love is giving back to a great college experience, giving these guys a great college experience through tennis um, and, and giving everything, um, kind of having them learn everything that I was able to learn through college and hopefully they, they get that out of it. Coach, I think you answered that very justifiably. And you, you've given us many reasons on what really drew you to those different particular coaching jobs. And it seems like what ultimately helped you stay and really enjoy those jobs were your relationships with your student athletes and yeah. like you helping them enjoy that experience. I do have a little bit of a hot seat question. Might get you in trouble with your wife a little bit here. It's not my intention at all. But I heard this peppered in there a little bit. And, and uh, I, when you said the word Purdue, I was like, ah, because <laughs> You know, any other thing, I know she has that background in Purdue. I, I have to know, just you know, even in like a little bit of a playful way, when we, when you had to tell your wife for the first time that. Oh, I think I lost you. I think. Oh. All right. Hey. Um. Yeah. There we go. You're good. That's yeah. good. Okay. I had to restart. Oh, Maybe we should answer, ask that question. Yeah, I mean, it's like Destiny's way of saying, don't go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me uh, change my stuff. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. I can hear you now. It just cut off all of a sudden. So yeah, I got you. I could edit that out later. So. Ben, can you hear me? Yeah, I can okay. hear you. Uh, no problem. Yeah. All right, my voice meter thing makes her just froze again. All right, so hey, well, anyway, what was, <laughs> maybe that was a sign from the gods. Don't touch this one. Now, I, I, there is like a little bit of a playful thing there because I know that there is that, that rivalry between yeah. Purdue and Indiana on all the sports. I mean, we, we've talked to baseball coaches and softball. It doesn't matter what it is. Well, what was her reaction whenever – I mean, you wanted to go to Big Ten, but whenever you had a chance to go to Indiana, it's not even just Purdue. But And I noticed this whenever you talked about Ohio State at the beginning. You, you didn't say Ohio State like the way Ohio State athletes usually say. And you know what I mean. Because usually it's like the Ohio State. Yeah, that's all new. I don't think yeah. you said that. <laughs> yeah, but for, for you, what, what was your wife's reaction whenever you uh, you were to interview or even to get hired at Indiana? Yeah, I know. It's funny. I'll tell you one funny story. When I, when I did get the job, 
obviously Lynn Loring, who is a, a legendary coach and, and won a national title, 10, probably 10 big 10 championships on the women's side. Um, he was kind of towards the end of his career when I got hired, but he, he obviously knew Gretchen well uh, from her playing at Purdue. And I think it was my first day at the job. I came into the office and uh, he said, make sure that your wife throws away all of her Purdue and, uh, you know, blank. So I <laughs> can imagine the word he used. So we kind of knew right then that uh, we weren't to talk about Purdue very much and how hot that rivalry is. Um, you know, we grew up, I grew up with the Ohio State Michigan rivalry, and that was obviously a little awkward when I was at Michigan. Um, as the assistant coach and then playing against Ohio State, that, I took that's what I was thinking of. And I said, that's what I was thinking of, coach, when you went to Michigan. I'm sure that wasn't yeah. easy for you coming from Ohio State. <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, I was definitely used to that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's definitely all the Big Ten schools have so many special things and so many amazing parts about them. I think the rivalries are one of the best parts of it. Um, and you know, we, we love the Hoosiers. We go to all the games, all the basketball, all the football games. And, uh, you know, we're close to a lot of the other coaches. So we're definitely, the Hoosiers are close to our heart now, but it was definitely different for Gretchen, uh, when we first moved in, but I'll never forget Lynn Lauren telling me that the, the first day on the job. Well, that, that's awesome coach. I, I mean, anytime one of our guests says, Hey, I have a good story about that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> It's just like a, I love these kind of things because it gives a glimpse into that. Um, I had a, a question originally about uh, as far as like the opportunity you wouldn't want to really pass on, but I think that you did a really good job of when you walked us through of talking with, uh, to us about why you didn't really want to pass up these opportunities. So I do have a different kind of an organic question for you, more of a on more of a philosophical level, and you know, kind of watching that Last Dance documentary, but also just watching several uh, different podcasts or listening to several podcasts and whatnot. I've noticed that, uh, you know, over many of the years, it seems like coaches from all kinds of different sports, they have something that they, they like to pass on to their athletes in some kind of philosophical way. So, for example, I just recently heard a podcast where Pal Gasol was on talking about, you know, what Phil Jackson was like as a basketball coach and how he would recommend books to his athletes and they'd always have some kind of philosophy when I was coaching high school girls basketball the coach would have a daily devotional sort of Christian book that the, the players could read if they wanted to read some people like you know Tony Dungy released a book like this where you know coaches would use these things I, I just didn't know from your perspective coach over the years what, is there any kind of philosophy like sort of motto that you use Kathy knows this really well because when we had Coach Stanton on, she was just full of these. She had like yeah. some of these awesome sayings. As far as you, like things that you read, things that, you, that you've that you come across before, is there any philosophical sort of thing or motivational thing that you, you often share with your players over your career or that you had shared with you in your course as an athlete that you would want to, to, to tell to us about? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, I think uh, – you know, as a coach, you're always trying to learn and you're always trying to grow as a, as a, as a coach and, and not just kind of get stuck in your own way. So I think it's always evolving. And I think you learn so much from your student athletes. I, I can go back to all the experiences that I had uh, or I've, I've had uh, with all my players. Um, and, and really, you know, one of the biggest things is the relationships that you build with these players and how important it is. And, you know, coaching the, the women's teams, you know, it might be different in some respects, but at the same time, it's, it's really about becoming close with your players and really building strong relationships that, that last a long, it lasts far longer than, than, uh, than they do on the court or, or their four years. Um, so I think, uh, I think that's, that, that's kind of the most important piece that I, that I really try to build is relationships and be there for each and every one of my players um, so I think, you know, something that I learned is, is how you do one thing is how you do everything. And, and I really try to share that with our team is, you know, if you're um, doing well in tennis, but your schoolwork is, is struggling, it's going to catch up to you. And at some point, um, you're going to start thinking about it, or you're going to be on the, the court and you're going to be down in the third set. And it's going to creep in your mind that you're not doing well in one of your classes, you're not doing well in school, you didn't study hard enough. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect you. Um, I think uh, uh, on the flip side, you know, if you're, if you're doing really well in school and you're not putting enough time into your tennis, 
and you're not really prepared to play that match and don't have the confidence, you, it's going to creep in your mind that maybe you don't deserve to win this match. So I really feel like you got to give to all parts. Um, your, your mind has to be clear, you know, your off court relationships um, with, with your, you know, significant others and families and things like that. Those all have to be kind of calm and at ease for you to play your best tennis. No one plays well really in chaos. They might say they do, but I really don't, I really truly don't believe um, that. So I really try to, to uh, get to know a lot of my players really well. So I'm able to help them. And then I can notice maybe, okay, you're something's not right, you know, and, and we can talk through it. And um, I'm hoping, I hope that my players feel that way and, and have definitely um, uh, learned that it's just as important what they're doing and tennis in school with the relationships with their with their friends and their families and their significant others all that plays into to being successful successful um going to books you know i, I love to read history books i love to read biographies um and, and learn about other sports um one book that i i always go back to uh is grit um it's a book grit by angela duckworth and uh it's just basically where passion meets passion meets perseverance. Um, and that equals the best, the best, uh, your best self or your best you can really give. So it takes a lot, a lot of work and a lot of passion. But if you put those together, um, you'll be willing to give more to a certain goal. Um, and so that's what I'm really trying to always get to. Um, that's not easy. You know, it was a lot of, for me to become the college tennis player that I became not a professional player, but a college tennis player, it took a lot of extra hours. It took a lot of late nights, um, either studying the game or, or going and riding the bike at the, the rec centers or just doing a little bit extra. Um, but I was only able to do that when I really made sure that everything else in my life was intact, that I could focus in on, on doing that extra work. And I wasn't worried about school. I wasn't worried about, you know, going and missing out on hanging out with friends. Um, you know, I think there is times to do all that stuff. So, yeah, I think that that's the one thing that uh, I really try to, to get across to my teams. Um, I think one other thing is, is the power of a team and what that can bring. Um, so, you know, the person next to you, you rely on that person, even though it's a tennis match, you rely on that person to, to win the match. And I've learned that from, from all my coaches that everyone has to be going towards the same goal and the same mission. And that's to get to four four points in the team match and your match isn't as important as another person's match and your practice isn't, isn't more important than this guy's practice. It really doesn't matter who you are or what you play on the team. You need to give the same effort and the same mentality to each and every practice and to each and every match. And we will be stronger as a team if everyone's pushing for, you, for, for that guy to win his match or you just know in your heart and you know in your mind that two courts down, that guy wants you to win just as bad as you want to win. And once we get that, we know we're a strong team and we're always striving to get that. I don't know if it's ever going to be perfect, but you're going to strive. I've been on a couple teams where that maybe that has been, where that match next to them or that match three courts down, or if they weren't even playing, it meant more to them than even the player that that guy wins the match or the team wins the match. Uh, once you have that, you know you have a special group. Um, and I think you can take that on to, to other to, to all walks of life and, and, and give to your, your companies or whatever you're going to do after, after college tennis. Um, and then lastly is energy. Uh, I want to hear you guys cheering for each other, pushing for each other, yelling, go Hoosiers, yelling for the guy next to you when they hit a good shot and encouraging them. So um, really energy teamwork and really giving to all aspects of your life at the highest level that you can give to. Um, and I think that all takes grit to do it. And I think that book um, really, uh, really does it. You know, another, another good story. I've tried, I've tried to read books with the team and it's, it's not, it's not always my, uh, I, I need to learn a better way to do that. You know, we read energy bus and, and, and some of my guys will, will kind of laugh. When, when they look back at that time it was my first or second year here, uh, probably my second year on the job here at IU. And we, we got the book energy bus by John Gordon and we tried to read it and we tried to talk about it and discuss it. But, you know, I, I, I didn't do a, 
I, we lost interest in it pretty quickly and it, it almost became a, a joke. So I don't know, I, I need to uh, maybe learn how to teach better or learn how to, to review books and, and go over them in a classroom setting, maybe a more, uh, I don't know, attractive way to do it. But uh, it's, uh, I love to read myself and, and I try to uh, get, that, uh, get, get the team to understand how important it is to, to keep learning. Coach, that was all very detailed and, and so inspiring. I love how you, you know, combine your love of books and you bring that to, to tennis and you show your people you coach how important it is to not only just be balanced in all facets of your life, um, not just tennis, but also just applying the things that you learn throughout the years. And it seems like you do practice what you preach because kind of going back to, to you coming over to Indiana, you know, most coaches, they have like an adjustment period um, during their first season. In, but you were able to really take off. Um, so, you know, you finished 17 and 10. Um, that was the record for the first season. And the Hoosiers had won their most overall, you know, matches and conference matches since the 2012 2013 season. So, how important was this first season um, for you with the team that you inherited? Yeah, no, there was, it was, uh, they were good players. You know, we had a, we had a great leader, uh, Sven Lalich, who was a, I don't know if he was a fifth, I think he was just a senior. Um, and he had played at a really good division two school for two years. I think he maybe had went to school late, so he wasn't, wasn't able to go D one right out of, right out of high school um, or, or maybe try to play professionally a bit. Anyway, he had won the national title at a school um, a division two school. And then he transferred to IU and played one year for the, the previous coach. And then his senior year, I came on and he, did an amazing job of keeping those guys together um, through all this, you know, through a coaching change mid-year um, and really led that team like a true leader um, and, and really kept everyone on, on, on target and what we're trying to do. And uh, so that was really, really amazing to have him to work with um, and, and to kind of feel like you, you could trust someone that's going to tell you what's wrong with the team, but also at the same time, he was willing to learn uh, my ideas and what I wanted to do. Um, well, not only myself, what myself and our assistant coach wanted to do um, and really what we were trying to build long-term and what we were trying to do that season. Um, and, and so we kind of just hit the road. Our first two matches, we won four, three um, in, in just crazy matches. I mean, we were down multiple match points in, in both matches to lose the whole dual match. We win both of them. The second one, we're down like 10 match points in the final match. I'm a local kid from Bloomington who we didn't really know too well. He, he, he'd gotten so much better um, uh, since the juniors. And, and so we win these matches 4-3. And it's like, wow, we could really do something special here. Um, and, and, and we did. And, you know, I thought that that was one of the uh, it, I'll look back on that year and I'll never forget the things that we went through and, and the, the personalities and the, the not knowing, I really didn't even know their last names. You got to learn who, who's going to play in the lineup. And we had like 10 players and I'm trying to on the go decide who's going to play one, who's going to play six, who's not going to play, who's not going to travel. Cause at the time I don't think you could even travel every guy. Um, so it was, it was a lot going on. And those guys, they, they handled it. They took it. But I think a lot, I'll be honest, a lot had to do with how Sven uh, Lalich led that team and, and really kept everyone um, intact. Uh, I think that was why we had such, such amazing success. Yeah, uh, very impressive that first season. You know, Coach, looking back over your career, your coaching career, and this ties into what you talk about the mental aspect too, but your mentality and your drive and how you approach with other players and taught them, I think that speaks highly of your success along the way. I, I do love the tie-in that your, your wife was also involved with the University of Denver program, which you guys had tremendous amount of success there. You had success everywhere you went. When you went back to Ohio State, Michigan, the alleged Indiana, and looking at this past season where the, unfortunately it was short because of the pandemic, but you guys were really starting to clear this season too I mean looking back at the schedule you guys were really on a tear there towards the end before the season got canceled I'm kind of curious from your take what was that initial reaction like for you whenever this COVID-19 situation happened and it got to the point where it literally just canceled the whole season like how did you handle that and how did you approach it with your players 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, going starting with this season, we were looking so forward to these seniors. Um, the four seniors were um, our first recruiting class and, and a special group that had gone through a lot, both on and off the court, but great students, um, really players that all overachieved. I mean, every one of them surprised us. You know, when we brought them in, we, we, we knew they were going to be a good group. We knew they were going to be good players. But to be honest, I didn't think they were going to get to the levels that they got to. Um, and so that that was pretty neat to see. So we were kind of so excited to, to give them their last go. And as the season's going on, you know, we start the season and um, we beat Memphis 4-3. We'd never beaten Memphis before since I've been here. They've had some really good teams um, throughout the year. So we'd lost them twice. Um, these seniors had lost them twice uh, in the past four years. And so winning that match 4-3 and, and, and then – we, we kind of went through a little rough patch. Actually, we, we lost to a tough Vanderbilt team um, that we thought maybe we should have won, uh, but then beat Notre Dame the next weekend. You know, it was just like in Notre Dame, we lost 7-0, 7-0, never even put a point on the board against them. So I guess my point is we were having a really successful season. Um, we were 8-3. and three. We had beaten Dartmouth, who was top 25 in the country, and then we had a week off. So uh, we we, we go hard after the fitness. We, we're really feeling, we're really looking forward to spring break, playing Northwestern, who's having a great season, and then going out to Arizona and playing Arizona and Arizona State. So we're like, okay, we got to focus on our fitness. We got to push these guys these couple weeks and really make sure that they're ready to go. And as, it's, as, these, we, as these two weeks are going, you're just seeing constant <laughs> different closures and, and uh, uh, you know, Seattle and, 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 and Stanford or University of Washington and Stanford are closing down campuses. And all of a sudden we're going online after spring break. And you're like, wow, this, this is really something real. What's going on here? And, and so he's paying closer and closer attention, but you're like, ah, nothing will go for it. And then all of a sudden when my players text me, the NBA just got canceled. They're not even having NBA games anymore. They're done for the year. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. And, and so you're kind of watching the news minute by minute and everything's changing and we're following the big 10 basketball tournament. And, and then thir it's Thursday. We're, we're supposed to leave Friday morning. So we have a long trip ahead of us. It's Thursday afternoon. Um, and I had a, a dinner plan with my seniors, you know, something that we did. So I was excited to do that. And we're going to leave on the next day um, and, and head out uh, for our great spring break trip, Chicago and Arizona. And Thursday afternoon, you get a call from our AD that, that it's canceled and the season's, season's done. So you're just, you're like in shock. You don't even know what's going on. Am I safe? Am I healthy? Oh my gosh, I was sick last week with a sore throat and a, and a, and a, and a, uh, a cough, you know, you know, was my, did my players have it? So like, there's a hundred things going through your mind. And, 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 and so I bring the team together. We have a meeting the two of the seniors are in tears. The younger guys don't know what's going on. Um, and, and yeah, and, and here we are. So it was just a total shock. We ended up going to Buffalo Louis, having a dinner that Thursday night. Uh, we had a one last team dinner uh, and enjoyed uh, some good wings and, uh, and, and just enjoyed each other's company. Uh, but I think still, I, I'm not sure it's really hit. You kind of, it's kind of, everything's at a stop. So it feels like that was, maybe last week or just a few days ago, but it was seven weeks ago. So, you know, it's just, it's just a crazy time. Yeah. Coach, I mean, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is like you mentioned several of your players or a couple of your players getting emotional about that announcement. I just couldn't imagine how tough that was. We had the opportunity in previous shows to, to speak to like Coach Stanton, Robbie and Kathy did, and haven't heard to explain that to to her players and, and staff about the cancellation. We've talked to several student athletes too about what that was like for them to adjust to that. Uh, I, I just can't imagine that how difficult that was for you guys to go through that situation. Uh, but again, we thank you for sharing that though. I mean, it was just a, a very unique situation, but I did have a curious question to ask you because they we had heard the news about the spring uh, student athletes have the eligibility possibility of coming forward is there any athletes on within your program that are planning on coming back next year with that opportunity yeah so um i'll kind of go through our four seniors uh Payam Amadi, uh who was very good student 
a 4.0 student um, got accepted into law school um, at three schools. He actually got accepted to USD, Pepperdine, and Santa Clara. And he's still deciding between those schools uh, which one he wants to go to, um, but was kind of set on going out to, to those schools out in California and continue his education um, in law. And so his plan is to do that and then not, um, uh, at least not take his year at IU. I'm not sure what will happen if he'll play at one of those schools out there, but uh, that, that is his plan. And, and I think he, he feels good about that. Um, Zach Brodney uh, is another kid from Los Angeles and he was accepted. He's in the finance world and he got accepted. Uh, or he, he took a job actually, and, and it's still on uh, fortunately. So um, I believe he's going to, continue to, to go that route um, and, and, and go into the working world. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, Zach was a very, very talented player, a great competitor, someone that won a lot of matches. Um, so I think he got a lot out of his four years. I think he's ready to, to kind of move on and, and, and go into the real world. Um, Will Pekarski is actually from Bloomington and was playing a lot of doubles this year. Uh, and doing very well. And he's decided to take the year and, and come back. Um, and I think it's fortunate, you know, he's from Bloomington. So I think, you know, IU is, is so passionate about IU and loves the school, loves Bloomington. Um, so I don't think he would ever miss the opportunity of, of, of not coming back. I think he was excited that, that he was going to be able to do that. Uh, and he got into the finance. Uh, he's going to get his master's of finance. Um, it's a, it's a one year program that he was able to get into and he was in Kelly school of business. So I think it helped that uh, he was doing so well in that, in that school and being a local kid, he was able to get into the program. So he'll be back, which will be great to have his experience. Um, and, and, you know, he hasn't played a ton of singles, but at the same time, when you take a 22, 23 year old um, and you put him up against an 18 year old, a lot of times the 22, 23 year old is going to be more successful. Uh, just because they've been through so much more and they're so much more mature. So, you know, for him, you know, it, it could be something special for him next year and to definitely take advantage of it. And then Bennett Crane, uh, he's our number one player. Uh, he played number one for us last year. And Bennett was having a great year. He was 49 in the country, had some multiple nationally ranked wins. Um, he had surgery three days after this all went down. Um, he had a torn labrum. And so he was playing and through all these injuries, uh, he was having such a great year. So he kind of was, had his mind made up that he needed to get through the season and do the best he could for the, more for the team than for himself. But he, but, it, but he was having such a great season himself because he was playing so hard for the team. Um, and, and so he had this surgery because they were going to cancel elective surgery. So he's like, okay, I got to get this done now. Um, and part of it was because, you know, that was before they even ruled if you were able to play next year. I think part of it was like, well, we better get this done or who knows when you're going to get it done. You might not even be in Bloomington or IU anymore. Anyway, so he got it done and he's kind of waiting to see how that that turns out. Um, but we're really hopeful and really hope um, that Bennett will be back playing for the Hoosiers next season um, as long as his arm feels well, arm is better and that he's mentally um, ready to give it again and give it another go. But we'd love to see him finish what he, what he was had started this season and throughout his career. Um, and he would make our team so much better, so much deeper, and, and really give us a, a guy at the top of the lineup that's won. Um, but just, uh, just a great person, a great leader that could help us a lot um, next year. So we'll see. I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue to talk with him and, and, and see what, uh, what he decides to do. Well, Coach, I mean, I, I think you gave a good – for one, thank you for the update with the with the student-athletes. Yeah. It seems like you got a good blend there. They all sound very ambitious. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'm going into their, their respective careers, which it sounds like they're going to make a hell of a lot of money, <laughs> depending on yeah. what they're doing there for sure. So, But, uh, but also – You're better than I am, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great that you have one that's uh, that's definitely planning on coming back. We wish him the best, and obviously we support him. And then of course Bennett, you know, we hope he makes a full recovery, and he also has an opportunity to make that decision to come back too. Because I, I get these guys that are moving on for their various reasons, so it's not the best whatever the decisions they have. But 
trying to put myself in their shoes too. You you really only get to live this moment once. So I can, I, if I would have, if it was me and I had the opportunity to come back to IU to play tennis again for an additional year, I, I, there's no way I could pass that up. Yeah. I, I just could not uh, miss that opportunity because I think 20 years from now I would I would regret not t- taking that opportunity. But but either way, thank you for that update and coach. Yeah, Hardy. no, and it, really, it's a it's a Fred Glass and, and Scott Dolson. Um, being able to make this happen for all of our seniors is incredible. It's not the same at a lot of schools. A lot of coaches are calling me and they either have to fundraise to bring their players back or they're not even allowed to bring their players back. And that's within the big 10. Um, so, you know, uh, we're so that really shows their commitment to the student athletes and how much they want to give to these, to these players and, and really give them the best experience that they can give. And um, I, I think that's a true testament to this, this athletic department at IU. Yeah, but well said, Coach. But we're going to head to the closing thoughts segment here. And since this is your first podcast appearance, and especially with us and hopefully not the last, uh, this is where we usually would go around the room and get each other's thoughts. And and I, I think it's just too important. There's so much that we – take from each show coach we we treat each one like we're going in also trying to learn a lot ourselves and like I told you earlier on the show uh, I know tennis a little bit but not as much as I would like especially going into this interview but I've learned so much from you and I definitely am walking away with more of an appreciation for what you do what your players do you know what that path was like for you leading up to where you're at now it, it's just a, a special moment there for us overall but I think it's just too important to get the other guys thoughts Robbie did you have anything you wanted to leave coach with well coach I mean just again investing your time in us and allowing us to learn more about you and your program is great because we want to get attached to all the programs also giving us a glimpse from the coach's perspective of just how how tough that had to be to be around the seniors and to, to see their reactions because ideally as a coach you want to do that senior day or that senior night with them but to have it taken away and it was completely and utterly out of your control. It was just something so unprecedented uh, that we haven't seen something really like this since 1918, uh, at least something that extreme to close things down like that. Uh, and I, I think that from the way it sounds, you and your players handle it gracefully. And I know life moves on, but at the same time, man, I, I just really appreciate you giving us and our listeners a chance to, to hear at least a little bit what that was about, even though that had to be very difficult to articulate. So coach, I do appreciate that very much. Yeah. Kathy, what about you? Did you have anything you wanted to leave coach with? Yeah. So coach, it was so great to talk to someone who's successful at a sport that I loved playing, but was so bad at. So, so thank you for talking to us today. Um, I loved your background story and, and all of your insights. And I also love that you have touched a couple of the biggest rivalries within the big 10 with OSU and Michigan and also IU and Purdue. Um, I can't wait for the future of the men's tennis team. And I hope that you all are able to practice and get out there sooner than later. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, uh, Coach, we'll talk to you a little bit after we get the show all wrapped up. But again, I, while we're on air, I just wanted to thank you again for your time. I know you, you didn't put any kind of type of time constraint on this episode. You seem like you really enjoyed the experience yeah. overall for your first podcast. So uh, I love that. But uh, I really like to, since this was your first podcast experience, I really would like to ask you one more time before we end, what was it like for you getting to go through this whole uh, conversation? Yeah, no, it was great. I, there's things that I hadn't thought about in a long time. Um, I think I hadn't thought about some of my moments uh, playing as a freshman in the SEC. That's something that I really don't talk about much and I don't think about very much, you know, and then kind of transferring and going to Ohio State and, and looking back on those moments, you know, you're, you're kind of living, living it all, but you're not, uh, I mean, I've lived it all, but you don't really uh, think about kind of my days of playing. I'm kind of living all my players' careers now and living through them and helping them achieve what um, they can achieve and, and, and do well in both tennis and, and school. So I think just thinking back to myself as a player and, and the, the experiences I went to, um, you know, it really touched on a lot of things that maybe I need to bring back and talk to my current players about more and, and, and can't forget that I did play this sport. So <laughs> um, I didn't only coach. So uh, it, it really, uh, it was fun to talk about. Yeah, I love it, Coach. And like I said, you're, you, I don't know how many are in that profession of coaching tennis that has never actually played 
the game, whether prep or collegiate, but, but you do have that ability where you can talk to him because you've been there. And I think that's yeah. a, that's a huge thing to have that experience factor. Like, listen, guys, you know, I've been there, I've been through the trials and tribulations. So it, it helps them make them better. And maybe they prevent, it prevents them from making maybe same or similar mistakes that you felt like you might've made or people that you witnessed made over the years. So I, I'm, it's really good for us to hear you have those takeaways from the show. So maybe someday, hopefully again, down the road coach that we can touch base with you again, we'd love to have you back on the show in the future. If you're ever inclined to want to do that again, for sure. But, uh, but yeah, just before we close out, I wanted to make make sure we have a shout out for our next episode that we're going to have on Friday morning. We're going to welcome Krista Van Zant, the assistant uh, women's volleyball coach will be joining us. It's also her first podcast appearance, Jeremy. So you're not the only one, buddy. So it's yeah. coming on. So we're we're really looking forward to to having her on as well. And hopefully she enjoys the experience and has some takeaways from it as well. But again, thanks, Coach, for joining us uh, to the IU Media Relations Department, Jeremy Rosenthal and company. Thank you for for giving this opportunity again to get to know the coaches. And we we love having. The, the chance to either build on relationships or develop relationships with you guys. And like I say, coach, we, we're not biased to, to sit here and say that we're like a neutral from everything. We're, we're very supportive of, of Indiana and of very, the program, and we, we just want to help. And I think that's one of the things that we hope that our listeners appreciate you and the tennis program a little bit more, because I think you guys deserve exposure and that's what we're trying to do for you uh, on today's episode. But again, we're going to go ahead and close out. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their Wednesday and go Hoosiers.